Hey, Rube. Hey, Dave. How's it going? It's gone. How's your trip? <laughs> it was fun. You're not still on it? No, I don't think so. Well, welcome I think, back. I think I'm back. Thank you. Uh, we're pre-recording this one. Take the uh, the illusion away. It's the middle of summer. Not a ton going on in the football world, but we are dedicated to bringing you guys podcasts each week. Uh, this is Eagle Eye Podcast. He's Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Uh, we got through a bunch of your questions the last couple of weeks. So uh, today we thought we'd have some fun. We did this last year during this dead period, just kind of categories. It was like most memorable moments and favorite games. So um, we kind of decided to extend that a little bit. We have a bunch of these different categories. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm curious to see if any of our answers uh, match up. It's always weird when we do it, and this is not like a, a shot of you, but you obviously have like a lot more years covering the team than me. So, so many of yours are like, it's rare that a lot of your answers come from the same era. Some, that, some of mine here do. Some of them a might. A lot of them do. Okay, good. Uh, should so, we just start into so this? There's no real way to get into this, is there? No, none of these questions are related to each other. Uh, we might come up with more as we go, but let's uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah. All right. This is a lot of fun. I had fun doing this last year, so yeah. I'm hoping this lives up to it. We uh, did use up a lot of really good categories last. We last did. Year. We should have been a little more uh, selective. Yeah. yeah. But we'll we have some good ones, and yeah. the first one is which current player on the Eagles would make the best coach? Yeah, and so like I think Jason Kelsey would be a really good coach, but guys like Jason Kelsey. I don't think he's going to want to do it. Guys like, I don't know. I, I think there's a chance he might. I mean, there's a chance. I think um, guys that play a really long time and really understand what goes into coaching, the time commitment, um, not a lot of money, the responsibility, the pressure. Um, a lot of guys that play that long don't want to do it. Also, if you make a hundred million bucks, now you're going back to ground zero and starting over. You're not making any money. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I thought two things. First of all, who usually becomes good coaches? A, backup quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And B, it's it's to me, it's generally really cerebral, thoughtful, often quieter players um, who uh, you know have a really mental approach to the game. So I started with Ian Book just because – Backup quarterbacks a good start. And, you know, when you, you go to um, – you know, from Mike Kafka to Doug Peterson to um, G.J. Kinney, uh, so many former Eagles backups uh, have become good coaches, really good coaches in some case cases. And Ian's a really thoughtful guy. Um, look, he's not going to have a career as a player. Good for him that he's he's done it this long. Um, he's 5'11". Um, Can't wait for his Hall of Fame speech. <laughs> Ruben Frank thought I couldn't do it. He didn't believe in me. Uh, but I do, I do think he would make a, a good coach. You just have one conversation with him. It's like talking to a coach. Yeah. Um, the other guy I put down was James Bradbury. Uh, I think very he, quiet, very quiet, but um, can be forceful when he wants to be, and um, I think has a really uh, very intelligent, cerebral approach to the game. Um, he, he, and he hasn't. You know, it's not like he's. Uh, I don't know. I just, I just, he, he just came to mind. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes like the great players for whatever reason, don't become the best coaches. And I think some of it is like, well, the why Ted, can't you do this? The Ted Williams thing. <laughs> yeah. Just why hit the ball. Hit 400. <laughs> yeah. Just hit it's it. Problem. Uh, I come up with one. I like on, and he's a young guy on defense. We haven't even seen him play yet, but I think the Kobe Dean would make a heck of a coach. Interesting. Yeah, we, we don't know what kind of player he is. Yeah, but, I, but like he's a, obviously a smart guy, has leadership qualities, knows what to do, knows how to do it. I think he would make a heck of a coach. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he he's a, um, a very naturally unselfish guy. Um, I remember asking him last year about, man, you get tired of playing special teams and not playing on defense. No, I'm like mm -hmm. trying to help a team get to a Super Bowl here. No, I, I love special teams, so that that kind of mentality definitely helps. That's a good one. Yeah. Any I, any of the older players? Uh, well, I did have Kelsey listed. I think he would be a fantastic coach. I do too. It's just I don't think he'll do it. Yeah, I think Lane would be a great coach too because of his understanding of technique and um, and all the little intricate details that make him such a good player. But you're getting into the territory where these guys have made so much money. Do yeah. they want to? coach and i don't know if they do yeah i mean it's something you really have to, and 
you know, understand the lifestyle these guys live. Like you look at Sean Desai's bio. I mean, he's been in what, like 14 different mm -hmm. cities. Now, if you are a, a high level player, you get to skip a few steps sometimes. True. But especially if you're a quarterback. Yeah. But still you're signing up for, you know, if you have young kids, you're signing up for a lifestyle where you could be moving around. Mm -hmm. um, you're not making a ton of money. Now maybe you did at some point. Now, a guy like Ian Book, He's going to need the money, probably. I mean, he, he made some money last year. He's on the roster. But uh, you usually see those middle-of-the-road players become – I mean, look at Doug Peterson. Yeah. Uh, it's the ba backup quarterbacks. It's the way to go. Backup catchers. Head coaches. Become the best managers. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll move on to the next one. There's so many. I mean, I, T. Martin is, is mm -hmm. doing well. Uh, I mean, there's just a bunch of them, uh, former Eagles assistants. It's really cool. Yeah. Next one. Which current – slash former player would be best on TV. Now there are multiple roles on television. Um, so you can kind of go out that however you want. Uh, we've already seen Kelsey start to do the work. So I think he'd be very good at it. And I think he will be on TV. I do too. And I, I think he's, he's got a real natural flair for it. You can see it on the podcast, just his, he's just such an inquisitive guy. And he's he's like in this constant search for knowledge about anything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's a voracious reader. Um, I think he'd be a great analyst, like a studio analyst. Yeah, I, I think he would be. I don't know if you read the story. Zach Berman from The Athletic did a really good job. He followed him during the uh, the players. What like they bring all the NFL Network and they yeah. I forget what they call it. It's like a camp. It's like yeah, a, a boot media camp. boot camp. Uh, and it was it was cool to see how seriously he's already taking it, and he's starting his second career while he's in his first career, which is smart. Yeah, he's getting more viewership to his pod because of it. Uh, and like even like I know he was asking some media members like advice, and, and like he was really he laid the groundwork before he did his own podcast. Yeah, that's for sure. And he's just so good at it. Um, but it's more than that. Like he's I think he also has a real understanding of. Like it's you need just kind of timing and like when a topic's run its course and things that yeah. we aren't very good at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's really naturally good at all those things. So yeah, uh, he's the first name I put down. Yeah, I'll give you another one, Malcolm Jenkins. That's the second name I put down. Yeah, Malcolm, and we've seen him do a little bit. He's good. Yeah, I, I don't know why he's he's not more places. Maybe he's too um, thoughtful. <laughs> like I think you know you're looking for. Sometimes places are looking for like big, big personalities. And I don't think Malcolm has like a big personality, right. but he has enough and he's super smart. And I think he'd make a great color guy. I do too. Um, his voice, maybe he's just kind of. Um, he has a good voice. What he has a good voice. Like, I don't know, maybe. The he has a better voice than me. The inflections aren't there. Okay. He's kind of very steady i think that comes from his days as a player when that's what you want to be yeah. uh, but i think he'd be very good as well i think rodney would be good too yeah i do too i think Rodney. and he's done a little bit like you'll see him do spots um yeah he's he could have a good career i put down shady and i know he does <laughs> some stuff yeah he's apparently he's in the by the time you guys listen to this he might be the new uh guest host with skip bayless Oh, is that right? Yeah, he apparently is in he, the running for that job. He's so naturally funny. Um, he'd have to really like watch his language, depending on who he's working for. Um, he's he doesn't I mean, have much of a filter, which is good. Yeah, to he'll, a certain point, he'll say anything about anyone at any time. Um, that's what that's what places are looking for. <laughs> I saw something he did a few weeks ago, like the Jets canceled a mandatory minicamp, and he was like, I don't know. I thought they were going to be a playoff team, and now they're not practicing. <laughs> like, you know better than that, but it's still fun. And, yeah. and sometimes, like, people get up in arms about some of those debate shows, and I get it because, like, media gets lumped under the same umbrella, and, like, well, we do a different thing than, like, that show, and that's, like, they're all different, but... I think as long as you realize like it's entertainment, you have to view it through a different lens. Yeah, I don't think I've ever really watched any of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I have, but not like. I mean, honestly, when I was growing up, I, I used to watch um, Around the Horn and PTI every day. Who now? Who's on those? Around the Horn was like a rotating. It's like a rotating cast of sports writers. Like it's where you know, like Woody Page was a a, a long time guest on that. 
Um, and then uh, it was like, it was a Max Kellerman who hosted that way back in the day. And then PTI is uh, Tony Kornheiser and Mike Wilbon, who have been you know, long time writers and it's a pretty huge show. Really? Kornheiser, he didn't he write for the National? I'm pretty sure he did. Huh? The National. Do you know about the National? I know about it. It's incredible. Yeah. The National was like a national sports daily. And it was it was like reading like prime sports illustrated every day. Mm-hmm. Um, Al Morgani, who's who works for us, was um, he was. I thought you looked out there like Al's well, going to be here. I guess we don't have a Flyers pregame show today <laughs> in June. But if he was here, he'd be, he'd be right <laughs> over there. Um, Al Morgani worked for a bunch of Philly guys. Work. It was amazing. It was. I still have. See Ben. Ben says Tony Reale hosted around the horn. I think Kellerman was first, wasn't he? I think Kellerman was like way back in the day, and then Tony Reale took over. I don't know. I don't know these people. Oh. Yeah, check it, Ben. Yeah, Ben's the best. I like when you don't know it, you just check out. Yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Why are you guys even talking about it? Um, but I mean, so many, so many former Eagles have gone into broadcasting. Really. Yeah, it really is a lot. A lot of them. You know who used to be? He used to be on ESPN. It was Eric Allen. He was really good. I don't know why it didn't work out. Didn't last. But um, yeah, he was great. Very smart, very analytical. Anyone else on this team or retired players who you think would be really good? I think I think those are the main guys I thought. Some of the retired guys are already doing it, so yeah. Yeah, and then the the farther you are away from the game, the harder it is to start, I think. Mm-hmm. You, know, you lose your name value. But we mentioned Chris Long, obviously he's doing his own media thing, he's pretty good at it. Yeah. On this team, like I think Slay is so entertaining, but I don't know if he has the Discipline. The discipline and structure to like do it exactly but, man if he's doing something i'd watch it yeah i was thinking about him and he was on my initial list i also think man he just curses so much which is hilarious <laughs> yeah he's, it would have to be in a different format yeah he's so funny and um, i was right max Callum but was he's the also original host. he's all so all, all over the place mm-hmm. like he'll be talking about you know the receiver is about to go up against the next thing you know he's talking about you know the, the soup he's eating, and then he's talking about it was the way some sports writer had his shoes. Or I mean, he's like all over the place. Yeah, but maybe he could he could channel channel a little bit, focus in. He's a smart guy, yeah. very very entertaining, yeah. funny as hell. Yeah, he's one of the funnier Eagles I've. Oh, he's hilarious. Yeah, he's up there. Yeah. All right, move on a little bit. Yeah, I like this next one a lot. Yeah, this is good. Favorite stories you've written on the beat. You want to start? You have a few. I have a few. Yeah. You want to go back and forth here? A little sure, bit? sure. Um, back in 2015, I, I I was like back on the beat for a very short time, and the Eagles were going to Detroit, and Brandon Graham was finally like starting. Like he was a good player, and he was starting. So I did a a, a big feature on BG, and I found out stuff about him that I don't think anyone else had ever written about, and it was it was really cool to to do it. Um, like find like finding out that he like he was living in a rough area growing up and uh, sometimes those stories become like kind of trite but uh, it was just fascinating because he's always had his personality like throughout those things and I found out a lot about him I thought it was really cool to, like finally uncover stuff about a guy who had been here for that long right that's a good one um you just reminded me of one that's not on my list but um I, I, I used to do a, an annual like Thanksgiving. You're day. going Jason Avant. Jason Avant. That was a great story. Yeah, Jason Avant. I was talking to him about what his childhood was like in, in Chicago. And he's like, well, you know, I was I was selling drugs when I was a teenager. And yeah. um, he was gang. He was, you know, he was a gang member. And he, I mean, he's like the last guy you think he's of. He's the nicest human on the planet. Nicest guy. And he's, um, you know, huge in, in his faith. And But he, he told me what life was like growing up. And how he would um, he'd go to school with all his cash stuffed in his shoes. You know, and, and uh, yeah, he was selling drugs as a, what was he, 13, yeah, 14? Um, and stuff he had never talked about. That was that was a good one. Yeah, I I was like, I don't believe, I just don't believe you. I'm just, <laughs> that, this is happening. I don't believe this yeah. is happening. Um, Let's go back and forth. Give me another one. I, I, I've okay. got a, I got a handful here. Okay, good. Um, a few years ago. I've been doing this 40 years. You think I find five stories <laughs> I like? It was a, uh, 
<laughs> I it was the 10 year anniversary of the Eagles trade for Jason Peters. And it was just such a a big moment in the franchise's history that I I, I did like a, a 10 year revisit of that trade and how it came to be. And I did it as an oral history, which it's the only one I've ever done yeah. in my career. And they were really popular for a while. Uh, this is the only one I did. And I did it because I got so many voices that I didn't want to get in the way of it. Uh, I like the one of my favorite stories is one I actively tried to get out of the way of, uh, but it was fun. I, I talked to, of course I couldn't get JP for it, but I talked to a bunch of his former teammates. I talked to Juan Castillo for it. Talk to Andrew Brandt, who was with the Eagles at the time. Talk to Dick Dron, who was the head coach in Buffalo at the time. Like I, I worked hard to get all these voices, and I thought it came together really well. Yeah, that was a good piece. Um, this one just occurred to me. It was when uh, when I got Jeff Lurie on the record to um, to imply that Joe Banner, when he was with the Browns, was the source of negative comments about uh, anonymous negative comments about uh, Howie Roseman. <laughs> Uh, Jeff had done a presser in the in that back room off the cafeteria, um, and I was able to get him just between there and the hallway by himself for like twenty seconds, and um, and he just I'm just looking for the quote. Um, if there are league sources that are really based in Cleveland, that's not right. We th- we see through it all, um, but yeah, it was that was pretty cool because to get the owner of the team on the record ripping his former best friend yeah uh yeah that was a good one that was fun yeah my turn yeah i'm gonna go to the goat story oh that was a good one i love fun stories like that sometimes and it, we've talked about it on here before but if you don't know the 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 zoo in boston and the philly zoo had a bet during the super bowl in 2017 and the losing city had the name a goat after um I think it was the MVP of the Super Bowl. So there might have been a, a goat at the Philly Zoo named Brady. Uh, instead, there is a goat in the Boston Zoo named Foles, and I went to meet him one day. You did. <laughs> Spent the day at the zoo. Yep. Um, I'm going to give you – I have two more. How many more do you have on your list? One more. Give you two more. Second, second is um, when – I got Nick Foles to to tell me that he thought about retiring when things were going so bad for mm. him. Um, obviously, before he was Super Bowl MVP. And speaking of Super Bowl, and um, you know that was just one where, like, you just develop relationships. And Nick was comfortable. It was, I was doing that. I used to do a video series called um, Five Minutes with Rube. That's where yeah. it came out. And uh, I think Ben Sibin was videotaping <laughs> it our old colleague and, and I, you know, I asked him how rough that patch was. And he was like, you know, I just, it was so bad. I really almost retired and uh, nobody knew that. Nobody had any idea. He, he had thought about that. And you just think about what if he did like who was number three, Nate Sudfeld. Yeah. But I had to start that game. <laughs> so and they was the backup in the Super Bowl. Yeah, he was. So, um, I was really proud of that one. And, you know, I, uh, I just think the world of Nick and, uh, you know, just meant a lot that he told me that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I have a very stupid one for my last one. Uh, and it involves Nick Foles. Okay. And it involves Nate Sudfeld. All right. Because, oh, I know what it is. <laughs> they uh, kind of shared a resemblance. Yeah. And uh, now they didn't really, to us, we had been around them enough. Sure. But, like, there was always jokes that, like, Nate was Nick's younger brother. Uh and but like people would get them confused, and Nate was just this unknown young player. There were certain angles where they really looked especially similar. If they had ball cap on, mm-hmm. and and their and their teammates, I found out, started giving them a hard time about it. But my the coolest detail in the story, and it was a detail that I got to share to Nick that he did not know, was that there was a point where Nate came out of the tunnel and in the visiting stadium, and the fans were going Nick, 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 Nick. So Nate didn't know what to do. And he stopped and he signed autographs as Nick Foles <laughs> and Nick didn't know it until I told him, he was like, Oh, that's fine. That's, <laughs> I'm fine with that. But uh, that was just fun. Somebody yeah. out there has got forged M- Super Bowl MVP <laughs> yeah. autographs. Yeah. They're going to go to a, a place and be like, that's not his autograph. My favorite story I've ever done is go back to 2004. 
And if um, we had the two weeks between the NFC Championship game and the Super Bowl, and I was trying to think of something I could do different uh, at the Super Bowl. And Rich Berg was one of the Eagles PR guys at mm -hmm. the time, who's now Temple's SID, Temple's football SID, and um, great guy. And I was in his office, and I said, what if, you know, back then media day was not what it is today. There's no fans. Um, and I asked, what if I could just, just follow Donovan throughout all of media day? And he, Rich asked Donovan, and Donovan was like, well, what am I going to have to do? He's like, nothing. You, like, I'm not going to interview him. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk to him. I'm just going to watch everything he does. And, and Donovan said, sure. And I, I, I remember I had to get to Altel Stadium at like six in the morning, <laughs> um, which is later than I got here today, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, he, the first thing they did was the video headshots where they're on like a, a, a roundabout and, you know, they're shooting <clears throat> like the, the when they're introducing the players, it's what you see. Yeah. And um, and I like I'd been around Donovan at that point for six <laughs> years, but he was so naturally funny. There was no cameras around. We didn't have a camera. We didn't. I was no. I was working for a newspaper, um, and they said no photos. But I, I just watched everything he did. The way he interacted, just with the camera guys, with the 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 you know the producers and the assistants. He was so personable, so relaxed, so funny. It was a side I'd never seen of him. Um, and then, you know, and then I, I spent the hour with him when he was doing his interviews. And then they did team photos. All these things that they did. Um, I just got to tail him and and watch him. Um, and it was really really cool. It was a it was a and then I, I wrote the story that night, and um, it was too long. I remember that I can't <laughs> invent space. And uh, thanks for doing an impression. Five of us will and, understand. Not not even five, uh, but um, I was really proud of that story because it kind of showed a side of Donovan that nobody had really seen. Mm -hmm. And I hope that came out in the story. It was just how because he was so guarded. In, in public, um, but seeing him just being actually funny and relaxed and, um, you know, he's about to play his Super Bowl in five days. Yeah. And what was he at that point? I guess he was about 20, yeah, 27, 28. So, um, but it was, uh, I was really proud of that one. All right. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, player in the NFL you'd most like to cover. Yeah, I mean, I'd put Mahomes down just because – just imagine the stats I could come up with if I covered him <laughs> every week. You'd just be on the street corner yelling out stats. I, well, I'd do that anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I just think he's – I think he's going to be the best ever by the time he's done. Yeah, it's fair, fair to say. Uh, you want to cover greatness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I do. I, you know, I think Jalen certainly – Sure. Uh, in, in that – in that um, potentially in that – category but um if it's a player i don't cover that i would like to mm -hmm. um and i'm fascinated by him just his personality um the way he plays the game um you know just his his dad was a, a major league pitcher there's just so many interesting things about him yeah i want a similar route i said joe burrow okay there's something about that dude just just has the clutch gene i think and i think it'd be fun and it seems like he has a fun personality uh, a little dry sense of humor, which I, I like personally. Uh, you want to cover great players. I think he's a great player. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, other city slash sport you'd want to cover if you weren't here. Obviously. Yeah. And that was hard for me because like, I can't imagine living in a different city. I'd mm -hmm. never want to live. I'm like, I'm not going to go retire to Florida or Arizona. I just want to live here. I just love it here. Um, the only place, like I put the first thing I put down was like covering international track, but I, I need to get mad at me, so I crossed. No, that's off. fine. You're allowed to say that. Okay. Um, well, NBC does have the Olympics. Yeah, Chicago, cover the Olympics. So yeah, I would always, I've always loved. I covered the Olympic track trials three times: '88 in Indianapolis, '92 in New Orleans, and '96 in Atlanta. Um, you know, ten days each. You're just totally immersed in track. And I was just doing like New Jersey people, mm -hmm. but like Carl Lewis is one of them. You, you know, you're it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, there's just great stories. There's great stories there, great competition. And you're covering like 15 different sports, like every mm -hmm. event's like, you know, I think that would be fun to cover the Olympics. Yeah. I've never got, I probably will never get the chance to do it, but it seems cool. Yeah. I would love to. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that'll go with that. Yeah. I mean, for me, like, 
I just love covering the NFL so much that I, I can't imagine covering a different sport. I don't yeah. know. To be honest, it's the cushiest gig, I think, of the four sports. There aren't as many games. The schedule is conducive to, like, having a normal life. Well, the best thing about it is you get to tell stories during the week. Like, you yeah. come baseball. You know, it's just games. It's just games. Yeah, games all the time. Like, we get to really tell some stories because there's only 17 games mm-hmm. or 20 or whatever. Yeah. And least. I love it. I love the, the process during the week. Yeah. It all, and it, it just makes every game matter. And everything's about, like, looking ahead or looking back. I, I I like the process so much. Yeah, you guys should see Dave and I when we come out of the locker room because the locker room is I mean that's because that's where we're getting stuff that no one else is getting. Mm-hmm. That's the one place. So we get in the locker room Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We come out of there, we start walking back to the the frat house, the media house, and Dave's like, "Yeah, I got you know, I got BG saying this and this and this. Oh, that's great. I got Reed Blankenship saying this, this, mm-hmm. and, this. and that's yeah, that's my favorite thing about the job. Yeah, yeah. And the more you do it, like the better you kind of know how to play that game in there. Yeah. Yeah, I have some Stay tricks. Stay away from the packs. I have some tricks. Yeah, we both do. <laughs> All right, uh, next one. Which country would you most want to visit on an NFL trip? So we've seen the league is kind of expanding with these international games. They've had some in London. Uh, their Germany is now out there. Like, where Japan. would be? A- Eagles Me- played a preseason game in Japan once. Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. Where would you want to go? You want me to go first? Yeah. Australia. Oh, that's what I have. Really? Yeah. I don't think it'll happen because it's the logistic. It's just so far. It is far, but they're like, they're trying to expand there. They have like yeah. Jordan. My lot is a big, uh, like spokesman for NFL Australia. I think it is. Staff Roca. I mean, there's a ton of punters. Yeah. Uh, I've never been, you've never been there. Have you? No, I haven't. Yeah. It's one place I'd love to be. And speaking of Olympics in Australia, um, you know, my my pal Phil Sheridan covered the Olympics in Australia. Mm. Um, he, I remember him saying or, or messaging me when he got it. He's like, I can't imagine I have to take that flight again in, in two weeks or three weeks. What's the longest flight you've ever been on? Actually, that, that story's coming up. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That's, it's a good story. That story's coming we'll, up. We'll leave that. Yeah. But Australia. Um, I've taken so long. I flew from uh, JFK to Johannesburg. How that, long was that? Oh, I was like 17, I think. It was super long. And I did Toronto to Hong Kong, which was like 15. Now, did you stop for, for fuel anywhere? Or no. Just straight shot? Straight shot. Wow. Yeah. The worst part about JFK to Johannesburg was I had another flight after that. So you get off a flight, you have like an hour and a half layover, but then a two-hour flight. And that two-hour flight was the worst. You're just like, I just want to be there. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, Australia. Yeah, me too. All right. Favorite memory covering the Super Bowl in Phoenix. So I wrote three down. Oh, okay. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't decide. You just have one. I have one, but I have others that I can All right. talk about. Um, give me one of yours. Well, I think you were, you were there for this. Well, you're there for all of these really. We we're there together. Yeah. So, um, I had I had an idea of a story that I wanted to do on Eric Bieniemy because he was here in '99 when there were like 15 future head coaches uh, on Andy's staff on the roster, uh, you know, associated with the team. And I was just curious, like how that shaped his desire to become a coach. Which that was his last year, '99. It's the only year he played for the Eagles. Played for Andy Reid, Andy's first year as a coach. Um, and there they were 24 years later still together or together again. I was really curious about it. I never met Eric. I never talked to him. I don't think I talked to him when he was here. He only had like 20 carries all year. Uh, I didn't know him at all. And uh, so we were out at, in, um, we were up in Scottsdale for Chiefs availability. I think this, the second, no, the first day of availability. Yeah. And uh, we got there really early. Is that when we couldn't find the entrance? No, that was at the Eagles. That was the Eagles. Yeah. But we went in. Oh, yeah, it was really easy to find it. We went in, and they had a patio. All the assistant coaches had little tables on this outdoor patio. And I saw a sign that said Eric B. Enemy. I was like, God, there's – and, like, everything was going on with him not getting interviews, not getting hired. He might leave the Chiefs. Uh, he might go to another team to help his hireability. I thought there's going to be, like, 50 people who want to talk to Eric B. Enemy. So I sat down at the little table – by myself, nobody else came over, and Eric Bieniemy comes comes by, and the other guy was in a, a, like a quality control guy sitting at the table, um, and I introduced myself to Eric, and I told him what I wanted to write about, 
and he just went into this big broad smile and talked to talked for 25 minutes <laughs> about that year how influential all those guys pat Shermer, steve spagnola who was sitting on the patio as well um uh you know um Ted Williams was an assistant and his son was the other guy at the table. <laughs> like, so it was all kind of coming together and it was an amazing interview. I was really proud of that story. Um, and I was just shocked that nobody else was interviewing Eric B enemy that day. Yeah, it's good. Uh, uh, I'll give you my first one. Yeah. It was my interaction with CJ Gardner Johnson. That was great. At media night. Uh, like CJ is just a really quirky dude. Just, and it, that's one of my favorite parts about this job is like meeting these different personalities that yeah. I would never meet a guy like CJ Gardner Johnson in my normal life. Um, he's just out there. And like, I thought at times I thought we had a really good relationship and then it would be like, <laughs> we never met the next day. And it was, it was always very confusing, but um, I was like, I got to find this guy at media night and he had been doing, and I, it's a shame that he didn't sign here because he put out his first vlog from Super Bowl week, and that's probably the only one he's ever going to put out. <laughs> but it was incredible behind the scenes mm -hmm. access of that week, and he was doing it at media night. And I needed to talk. I didn't need to talk to him, but I wanted to talk to him. And I, I find him finally, and he starts interviewing me for his vlog. Uh, and then we switch roles. And I interviewed him. And but you have it, that on video, right? Uh, yeah, because we had Alex Ruin, our, our like how you point over to where Alex is. Yeah, our, uh, at least he is here. Our video editor, he is here. <laughs> Al Morgani is at the beach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Alex, yeah, shot it, and it was just fun because, and that that's my favorite part, and not my favorite part. But one of my favorite parts about covering these two Super Bowls is like these guys who you bother for an entire year are finally happy to talk to you because at least you're they know who you are. Yeah, and you you get more access because of it. Yeah, it's amazing how guys who who won't even talk to you all year are mm -hmm. your best friend. Yeah, that's my next story. <laughs> um, well, my next one is the same night. It was mm -hmm. that Tuesday night media day at the Footprint Center. Is that what it was yep. called? I had this idea of a story on Greg Ward um, because how many guys – he was on the practice squad in 17, and he was on the practice squad in, squad in 23. In between, he played, and he was a lead, he was leading receiver one year uh, in 20. Um I just thought, here's a guy in his sixth year, yeah, sixth year on the practice squad. Um, he's been on the practice squad for two Super Bowls. And it was just seemed like a really challenging, difficult, weird situation. And I wanted to talk to him. Now, you remember, I started trying to find him two weeks before, <laughs> I think before the NFC Championship game. He's never in the locker room. I saw him one time. I said, hey, Greg, are you, are you coming out? I need to talk to you. He's like, yeah, I'll be right out. And I never saw him again. Uh, never saw him during the week after the 49ers game where we, we had availability like three or four days, I guess three days. Never saw him those three days. Fly to Arizona. Media day, everybody has to be there. Every player, every coach, every assistant coach has to be there. I couldn't find him for the life of me. <laughs> and you remember, you because I, I would run into you, like we were both kind of walking around this giant arena and I couldn't find him. And we were down to like 10 minutes left in, in media access. And I was like, he's got to be here somewhere. And then I saw like, I saw a group of guys with Eagles um, hoodies congregated in the corner. And I saw Tyree Cleveland. <laughs> I was like, all right, practice squad receiver. I'll bet Greg's with him. Because you think of Greg Ward, like he's been here six years, but he's hanging out with the practice squad wide receivers. I walk over, he's got a hood on. <laughs> And I was pretty sure it was him. And I was like, Greg? He's like, hey. He's like, hey, do you have a minute? He's like, sure. <laughs> like, like, yeah. wh wh why'd you wait so long? And I, I told him, you know, I was like, I, w I wanted to talk to him about being on the practice squad for two Super Bowl teams. And, um, I mean, these are the stories that I just I love to write because it's just such a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he was great talking about it. I only had about, like, seven minutes with him, but he was really good. It ended up, like, I don't know if you care about, like, analytics it ended up being the most popular story i wrote the whole time we were in arizona uh, other than like 10 observations but um he was great talking about how he said it's it's not frustrating at all I've, i feel so so blessed to be a part of two great teams and whether i'm playing or not doesn't matter i'm i'm a part of this i, I know i'm an important part of this whether it's running scout team or being a leader and jalen thinks the world of great Ward. 
Yeah, yeah. I, there's a really big difference between how outside view practice squad players yeah. and, and the people in the building view them. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason he's still here yeah. um, in his sixth year. And he's still here now in his seventh year. Um, I think the coaches really respect him. I know Nick thinks a lot of him. I don't know if he'll be around another year, but you know, the last thing he said was, you know, I, I, I know I'm going to get my opportunity. So I'm not frustrated because I know mm-hmm. it's coming. I don't know where. I don't know when. But I am going to play in the league again. And this is a, this is an important step toward that. Yeah. I was proud of that one. Uh I got a chance to talk to Isaac Samalu. Yeah. And sat down with him at a table. He was look, Isaac was a really nice guy. Now, at time. This wasn't media day, right? This was the this next was, day. Uh one of the Eagles availability days. Wednesday or Thursday. Sat at the table with Isaac and, and talked to him for gosh, more than I had talked to him the previous five years combined. Uh and it it's one of those moments where, like, look, we know Isaac doesn't want to talk to the media. That's not his thing. But he was willing to do it because he had nowhere else to go. Like they're forced to sit there and he knows who I am. We've talked before and he opened up about stuff that I like. I had never known about like him struggling mentally with uh, just being in the NFL. And and he opened up to me about his mental health and how like how many great strides he made and how much of a better place. Getting benched at 16, right? Yeah. Like all that stuff, the expectations, getting back from that. uh, and, And that was fun. Um, I enjoyed that. And it was, I hope it gave people a chance to like get to know a guy that was not doing many interviews. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. I remember when you were telling me about that after we went, we got back to the car. You were like, Isaac? <laughs> and I was like, seriously? Um, number one, you're, you're involved in number one. You What's actually that? starred in number one. Um, losing our car on the way to the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> we we go out to the parking garage across the street from the hotel. It was me, you, and Barkan. <laughs> I think we were giving Michael a ride um, to the uh, to the stadium and uh, couldn't find the car. And we had been in and out of that parking garage what twenty times yeah. since we got there. And we tried to like I would always take a picture of where I parked last, but for some reason I didn't that time. And how long was it? it probably wasn't as long as we think. Yeah, it wasn't that long two hours but it was hot and we were trying not to sweat it was hot we had suits on and parking garages can be tricky because you don't know like how you get from one yeah yeah. like yeah so there's like different ups and different seconds and finally you just grab the keys and started running up and down every (laughs) ramp you know beeping it and finally i remember you call you're like come down the ramp and make a left (laughs) and we drove off that's funny it's like i can just imagine like calling the boss and be like hey i missed the game because (laughs) Uh, my last one was a, a couple days before the the game. I finally had a chance to go do a little hike. Yeah, it was just fun because it's like you're in Arizona. And you're like, man, I just been I've been working this entire week, so it was nice. I got a chance to like breathe a little bit. I went out to a, a really cool trail uh, with our marketing director and uh, saw a coyote. The second I got on the trail, it was fun. It's a good experience. Yep, and it was, I couldn't do that in Minnesota a few years before that. So. Uh, last one before a little break here. Most underrated player you've covered? I went William Thomas, Willie T, mm, linebacker. Um, one of only 13 players in NFL history with 25 sacks and 25 interceptions. Um, one of only four with 35 sacks and 25 interceptions, along with Ray Lewis, Ted Hendricks, and Bobby Bell, who are all Hall of Famers. Wow. Uh, Willie T was such a playmaker, 10 force fumbles, 27 interceptions, 37 sacks uh, as a as a linebacker and made a couple of pro bowl pro bowls early in his career. Uh, but overall, I, I just thought since he, you know, when you think about that 91 defense and that just kind of that whole year, that was his rookie year. He was drafted uh, Cotite's first year. You just don't think of him, but he was really, really good player. Did you have just one on your list? I just put one, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll give you just one. Jeremy Macklin. Yeah. He because he got over shadowed by uh, Deshaun, but man, Jeremy at his best was an elite receiver. Yeah. And it, it, the window wasn't long, but he was great. Yeah. He, he was, was a great player. Yeah. Devontae Devontae reminds me a little bit of him. Um, I see it in his body control, his mm-hmm. toughness as a smaller guy. Yeah. Um, and Macklin was just such a great guy. Um, yeah, he he was a real team player. He was on his way to an unbelievable season um, in 14 when Nick got hurt, and then Sanchez just 
couldn't get him the ball as much. But I mean, he was on his way to like sixteen hundred yards or something. Or he something. still finished with like fourteen. Didn't still he? finished with fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, had a great year. I had a couple other guys here just real yeah, quick. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Todd Harriman's. Okay. Who was a good starter for a long time? Played yeah. just about every position on the line, other than center. And then Corey Graham, because okay. his last year here was not good. People forget how important of a piece he was on the Super Bowl team. He was. It's a shame for him that it ended the way it did, but like he played well in seventeen. Yeah, he did. He was one of those those older guys at the end of their careers who just kind of put it together yeah. for one last yeah. year. Probably wish he didn't come back for eighteen. Yeah, it didn't go well, but seventeen he was good. Yeah, there's a bunch of guys that was like, and he doesn't get listed as like. A part of that for whatever reason, like we never ever talks about Corey Graham being on the Super Bowl team. He played a big role that year. He did. I think the, that that whole group of guys who like um, um, Patrick Robinson, Blunt, Ajay, Corey Graham, they're all it was like their last good year for mm-hmm. all those guys. For some, it was their last year. It was like a bunch of guys like that, and they never did anything again. But man, um, I'll, I'll give you one more since you gave me two. I'll give you Andy Harmon, mm, who yeah. was a six round pick. Um, had a very short career because he had knee issues, um, but he had what three straight seasons with like as an interior lineman had um, from from ninety two to ninety five had seven eleven and a half nine and eleven sacks over a four year period um, thirty eight and a half sacks and it was a second most among interior linemen in that four year period. Wow! Uh, never made a Pro Bowl. Had eleven sacks twice without making a Pro Bowl as an interior lineman. A really good run stuffer. Uh, uh, another guy from that 90, uh, 91 draft, Willie T and Andy Harmon. It was yeah. an underrated draft, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. I, I'm surprised you didn't say Mamula. Mamula is, is underrated. Yeah, I know. That's why yeah. I'm surprised you didn't say him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 31 and a half sacks people. Somebody somebody told me he was he was the worst player of the Eagles draft. This is recently, like two weeks ago. I said, how many sacks do you think Mike Mamula had in his career? He goes, I don't know, four. I said, how about 31 and a half? What? Yeah. People need to. I mean, he wasn't a star, but at playing at two forty-five every down, when he should have been like, if he played today, he'd be like a, you know, a third-down specialist, getting ten sacks, and people think he'd be making eighty million a year. <laughs> Overrated. Catch Just, all the oh, sports action and more at Rivers Casino, Philadelphia. Whether it's the money line or the patch line, there's something for everyone in a great sports book. Rivers Casino, Philadelphia. Philly loves a winner. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. I started that without knowing you were going to say the wrong word. <laughs> uh, overrated. Most overrated player you've covered. Well, I, I put a spin on this and went with a coach, Buddy Ryan. James David oh, Buddy okay. Ryan. Most overrated figure in Eagles history. Imagine having... Reggie White, Clyde Simmons, Seth Joyner, Andre Waters, Byron Evans, Wes Hopkins. I say Eric Allen, Byron Evans. Um, uh, imagine having a defense, you know, uh, Mike Pitts, and then having Keith Jackson, Mike Quick, Randall Cunningham, Keith Byers on offense and never winning a playoff game. Not only not winning one, but losing th- all three by double digits and getting embarrassed in all three, two of them at home. Um for some reason, he's incredibly popular in some segments of Eagles fandom. Um, but he was a he was a great defensive coach, certainly with the Bears, um, and at times here. But to have that kind of talent and not win anything, yep. it's hard to believe. I'll give you a bad one. Although people have kind of seen through it, yeah. At this point, yeah. maybe it's it's not a good one. But I'll give you one more. Uh, and look, he deserves his credit for the 17 season, but Alshon Jeffrey was pretty cooked yeah. by, by the end here. Like, don't want to take anything away from his accomplishments because he, he was tough that year. He played through a torn rotator cuff, but I mean, his career was pretty much, we saw him at the very tail end and he had a short career. It's crazy that he played three more years after that Super Bowl season. Yeah. Even during the regular season, he wasn't very good Yeah, uh, in 17, but that touchdown on that damaged shoulder hey. with Eric Rowe, I believe, covering him. Um, Deserves all the credit in the world. I, I would not put him on the list just because of that. It's funny because it's like Nelly. But, but I'm saying because of that, like I think everyone overrates his entire tenure here. Yeah, maybe. He made a ton of money here too. Yeah. 
They paid him a lot of money. The first contract wasn't bad. The second contract wasn't good. I had 2,200 yards in four years. Yeah, the first year, the first time was a one-year, nine million dollar contract. That was fine. Paying him again was a problem. Caught nine touchdowns that year in seventeen. Mm-hmm. Never did he ever retire? I don't know. I don't think so. He was miserable too. He was he was not a fun person to be. <laughs> he, he had his moments where he was okay. I was I missed those. Well, there was like the he was happy after they won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pluck any player. Uh, on offense or defense, out of time, Eagles all time to put on this roster. Who would you go with? Well, um, the first guy I was thinking was um, um, James Houston because I'm thinking like I need a linebacker from Georgia. <laughs> but um, I went with Dick Buckus. Oh wow, you went back there. Huh? I went back there because six three two forty five back then as an as yeah, an inside good. linebacker. Um, Probably the best linebacker ever. Five time all pro, eight straight Pro Bowls. I think he could help in the run defense a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, so- Nick, Nick Morrow deserves every shot to make the team, but I'm going to give Buckus a rest. Yes. <laughs> Watch that training camp battle. Nick Morrow <laughs> against Dick Buckus. Uh, I went with Doc. I know it's a pretty layup answer, but I need some safety help, and he would help. He still fit. Yeah, God, he's probably playing lately? now. I know, every time I see him, I'm like, this guy looks like he's playing tomorrow. Yeah, I know. Now he'd probably have to change his style a little bit to not get kicked out of the league. Yeah, but people forget. Like people always think about him being this hard hitter. Doc could cover. Oh yeah. Like people forget that he was like he had other parts to his game. It wasn't Absolutely. like he was just head hunting out there. No, he had what thirty? Let me see, uh, thirty-four. Uh, I think he's tied for the team record, thirty-four mm-hmm. picks, yeah. tied with Eric Allen and Bill Bradley. Yeah, yeah. Anyone on offense? All had thirty-four. Um, no, I just no. Okay, I said Shady. He'd be fun on this team. Although Nick would have a conniption watching him hold the football. A loaf of bread. Yeah. Uh, next one. Which player you've covered would make the best reality TV star? You want me to go first? Yeah, I got Jeremy Bloom. Oh, okay. I sort of think about like Jeremy. Jeremy's a great guy. He started his own company. That's now this billion dollar company. Um, he he started a charity. It's like a Make a Wish Foundation for senior citizens. Um, uh, like a last wish. He's an Olympic skier. Got drafted in the NFL. Um, There's already a movie about his sister. Yeah, a movie about his sister. You ever see that? Um, I've read about her. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? I've read extensively about her. Um, um, he's lived such an incredible, fascinating life. He's still skiing. Molly's game. Yeah. Molly yeah. Bloom. Um, Jeff Laurie told me about that movie. So I went to see it. It was great. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm Facebook friends with Jeremy. We keep in touch. And um, he, he's, he, he, to me, he's maybe the most interesting guy I've covered. So I think, yeah. I, you know, and I, I don't know. He could probably sing. So you want to put him on one of those shows. He can do anything. Uh, talented, um, very generous, charity-minded, um, and uh, fascinating guy. That's a good answer. Let me give you the right answer. Yeah, what do you got? Michael Bennett. Michael Bennett. I want to see Michael Bennett 24 hours a day because he's doing some weird stuff. He's doing – I mean, he, he's got some weird stuff going on. Says whatever comes to his mind, the second it comes to his mind, I would watch that show. Michael Bennett show. Yeah, I'd watch that. Remember T.O.'s? Uh, you ever watch To's show? I didn't. It was so bad. Was it? It was so bad. All right. Worst. He thought he was funny. He was just so not funny. <laughs> worst flight slash hotel experience. So you asked me my longest flight I've ever been on. Yeah. So that leads to this one. I, I put a few down here, but I'm. Uh, this is Eagles played the 49ers, and this had to be 90s. It might have been that 96 game out there, and. Uh, we, we were sitting on the tarmac in Philly for like two hours because it was just pouring. It was, weather was awful, like hail and stuff. So we're already on the plane two hours. Finally take off. It's like it's like six-hour flight to SFO. So we're about to land. And you know how you come in over the bay and like Burlingame is on your left? And um, you're coming in over the water. And we're like even with the Marriott. You know, the Marriott's kind of like a couple miles south of the, of the SFO. And we're getting pelted by by the worst weather it's windy and finally we just start climbing out again 
and a pilot's like, yeah, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, the weather's just not going to allow us to land an SFO. It's just too windy. Uh, we're going to put her down in Oakland. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to fly across the Bay over to Oakland. And if you have anybody picking you up, uh, let them know, you know, come out to Oakland airport and, uh, we'll, we'll be over there. Sorry for the inconvenience. So we fly the, uh, you know, five miles to Oakland and we land. And, uh, so now by now we've been on the plane eight hours. So we land and they make an announcement. Well, uh, the weather's fine here in Oakland, but, um, we don't have a gate. Um, so if you told anyone to come meet you here, you, yeah, send them back to SFO because we can't get you off the plane. Uh, but the weather's still too bad in San Francisco to, to fly over there. So we're just going to keep her here for a little bit and uh, we'll keep you posted. Uh, we sat there for three more hours. Oh, my gosh. In Oakland, uh, just like on a remote run, you know, in the middle of nowhere in the Oakland airport. So by now we've been on the plane two hours in Philly, six hour flight and three hours. That's 11 hours. Uh, Kevin, you know, Kevin Callahan, he used to cover mm-hmm. the Eagles for the um, Courier Post. He was on that flight and it was, pa- it was a packed flight. They had no, there's no water left. I was lucky. I brought a bunch of waters, but I bring a bottle of water per hour of a flight. I, Cause I, I got, I try to stay really hydrated. Um, that's, no, you know, that's insane. No, it's not. That's what I do. A, a bottle per hour. I like that you said that's what I do, so it can't be insane. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so because you get dehydrated on, on those long flights, and um, they there was no, they had no food, and people were getting restless, and like yeah, get, people are like yeah, you get me off this plane. There's like, you know, just can't you pull up some stairs, and we don't have there's no stairs, um, there's nowhere to go. You get off the plane, there's no anyway. Yeah. So we finally. <laughs> We finally, and it was a late flight. It was like a five o'clock flight to begin with. So by now it's, it was like, I don't know, it was like two in the morning or I don't know what time it was, but so we finally, well, we got, we got cleared to head back over to San Francisco. We'll get you, we'll get you over there in no time. We take off, we go around the bay and we land. <laughs> like It was like, it was like four minutes, you know, with the vector to the sand, we landed and uh, that was before they had the monorail over to the rent car center. I remember taking the bus to the rent car center in the middle of the night. And I was staying up in, in Napa, which is <laughs> like a 90 minute drive. Ugh. So we were on the plane for probably between 11 and 12 hours and um, driving in the rain all the way up to Napa. I, I got there. I believe I got there at four in the morning, local time. So I got to my hotel room and like my friends back home are like, going to work <laughs> like it's the next morning here um and i was fried and kevin callahan got off the beat because of that he's like i just can't do this anymore <laughs> um but that was the worst flight i've ever been on i got we got we hit a bird coming out of new orleans and um blew out an engine um and the <laughs> the, the pilot the captain's like uh yeah we're gonna take her back to new orleans uh we lost an engine here and if we don't we're going to, we're going to dump some fuel and uh, we don't want to, we don't want a catastrophe here. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a flight. It wasn't that long ago. It was this year. I don't remember where I was coming back from, but I was in the aisle. I'm an aisle guy. And in the window was a mom holding baby with toddler in the middle seat. Uh, oh, I remember the story. Yeah, I, 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 I think I might have told it on a previous pod, so I won't go along with it. But uh, like an hour into the flight, it was a long flight, I think. An hour into the flight, this mom like announces to no one that she's going to take a nap. I'm thinking, all right, that's weird. So she takes a nap, and now I, I'm a father to a child. <laughs> this toddler next to me, like all of a sudden, and like the kid had nothing to do. So she's like playing with the stuff in the, the you know, the papers and the throw up bag and everything and then the the flight attendant comes down with the drink service and i'm like i don't know i guess the kid needs a drink so um she asks for some water so she gets the water and the little cookies and i get i think I like ginger ale and i'm sitting there she's like dunking the cookies into water and then i swear she picks up the water looks at me and while maintaining eye contact just dumps the water on herself at least it wasn't on you. I, I, it was, yeah, it wasn't on me, but it was like on herself and on the tray table. And I'm like, oh, well, all right. Now I need napkins. So I like hit the buzzer. And mom's sound asleep. I get napkins. I'm cleaning. You think the mom's sound asleep. Yeah, she's, she's probably like, let's pretend this. I'm like, 
I'm cleaning up and, and doing all this stuff. And then uh, the little girl's decided that she wants to put her tray table up. So she takes her cup and her trash, puts it on my tray. And I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. Puts it up. And the mom wakes up and she goes, oh, don't put that stuff on his tray. And I'm thinking, if lady, if you knew what had just happened to me. <laughs> that's the least that's, of it. Yeah. Uh, so that was, a, that was an experience. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah the only one, other one I had was uh, I was on a, a small plane. Um, Gosh, I don't remember even where I was flying, but <clears throat> the crew, the ground crew, left left um, um, the fuel hatch open, oh, and the pilot's like, "Well, we've been," and the pilot couldn't see it. He says, "We've been alerted when we we're uh, taxing out or uh, on our climb out that uh, we have a we have a hatch open, and uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna take you back to the field and get that closed because um, if anything got in there, the plane would blow up." <laughs> <laughs> a little bedside manner for these pilots, yeah. Huh? Yeah, so that was uh yeah. All right, let's get through these last few yeah pretty quickly. Least favorite player you've covered. Bill Romanowski. Oh, he was a jerk, huh? Yeah. And the thing about him was like everyone thought he was such a good guy because like when the TV cameras mm, were on, he would turn it on. Great personality. Yeah. He was a yeah, I almost said what he is, but yeah, he was a jerk. <laughs> I'll give you one, and it's someone I don't dislike, but I didn't like covering him. Really? Arian Foster. Oh yeah. Who I think is like a fun, interesting guy. But by the time I started covering him, he was a he was a pretty popular player. He was a good player, and he was kind of over doing media. And he would always like the thing that really bothered me about him was he would lump all reporters together. And such a big part of his thing was like players are different. Like I'm an individual. I'm not just a football player. But then he would right lump a it. hypocritical. Yeah, it was very hypocritical. And I I don't dislike him. Like I I and I listen to interviews with him now. I think he's a smart guy, and I, but yeah, I didn't enjoy covering him. Anybody uh, here? Uh, Sandejo. Yeah, he was a jerk. He was a jerk. Uh, favorite moment at practice? You want to start? Sure. Uh, I it was early me covering the team, and I wasn't doing it full time. It was during the Andy Reid days, and I do my stupid observation of the day uh, for every practice, and it was an OTA. It was back when we go every OTA, so I, I tweeted something at like infancy Twitter about, "Hey, I'll be looking for a stupid observation." And Evan Mathis responded and said, I'll find one for you. And it was like right before practice. So you picture Evan on his phone, like right before he goes out. Then I'm on the sideline during practice and I hear Dave, Dave, Evan Mathis calling me onto the field <laughs> to give me. And I'm thinking if Andy Reid sees me yeah. running out on a field, I'm going to be barred from this place forever. So I run out. Um, he tells me it. And then I run back to the sideline uh, and like, Luckily, Andy didn't see. Do you remember what it was? It was something about like tattoos, like the offensive linemen. These guys have tattoos, and these I forget what it was exactly. So, the Eagles practiced at JFK Stadium um, some days, which is was right here, right here, and and uh, it had to be, it had to be eighty, probably eighty seven. Was my first year. I started in the middle of the year. Had a terrible secondary. They're just awful. Um, Izell Jenkins and I, I, I remember who their who their safety. Andre Waters was the only one that was any good. Wes Hopkins was hurt, so they're probably playing Evan Cooper at safety. They were awful. And I wrote a column about the secondary and how they're they're terrible. They're not doing their job. The only one who's any good is Andre Waters. So the next day at practice, we're at JFK, and I'm on the sideline. Practice ends. And Andre, I don't know how much you know about Andre. Rest in peace, Andre. He was he was a hothead on the field. I mean, he was always getting suspended, uh, getting into fights. Um, but he was he was a sweet guy, really. Um, all of a sudden, Andre in full uniform is stomping up and down the sidelines, screaming, "Where's Ruben Frank? <laughs> Where's Ruben Frank?" And I've never been so scared in my life. <laughs> And um, I just started covering the team, so he didn't know me. We got to, you know, we got to know each other pretty well, but not yet. And um, I was like, I, I can either run and never come back, <laughs> or I can tell him I'm I'm Ruben Frank. And um, so I went up to him and said, I, I'm I'm Ruben. What what's going on? He says, You wrote that column. You wrote that column ripping the secondary. I said, Yeah, but I I said you're playing well. He said, No. He said. If you rip the secondary, you rip all of us. You don't single me out. If we're not playing well, 
we're not playing well as a group, and I'm part of that group. So you don't praise me and rip the other three guys. You rip all of us. Hmm. I don't think I've ever gotten reprimanded for not ripping somebody. And that was Andre. He was that. That was what a team guy he was. Because yeah, I think he had six interceptions that year. He had a good year. Yeah. Should have made the Pro Bowl. And and uh, he was he was mad at me because I said he was playing well. And I, was, I, I don't know what to say. I think I said, well, I can run a correction. Or something. <laughs> but, uh, that was my first <laughs> the correction. Is, I, on second thought, he's not playing well either. <laughs> exactly. But that's why he was he was furious about it. And uh, he came up to me in a locker room, I think, that day or the next day. And he apologized. He's like, I just, you know, I, that really bothers me because, you know, football is a team game and secondary is a, a group and we're a team and we, we, we have success together and, and we have failures together. You know what's funny? Like, so many players are so hesitant to say they read stuff. They're like, oh, I saw it because someone sent it to me. Yeah. No player will ever admit, like, yeah, I just went and read it. Yeah. No, my my cousin's friend's brother sent it to me. Yeah, all right. Well, they had they got clip. They had like clip services back then, mm-hmm. so they had like clips on their on their locker when they got in. Uh, yeah. All right, last one. First player you interviewed. Yeah, it was that same month. It was um, Mike Reichenbach, the linebacker. Oh. Um, who's from here? He went to East Stroudsburg. He lived in Philly. He coached high school football not too long ago in Philly. Um, I did. I you know I ne- I was not a football fan before I started covering the team. No. And um, I know I, I I was I was just never I was a baseball fan, uh, basketball, but I never really followed the NFL. And <clears throat> all of a sudden I'm in a locker room. <laughs> like I just. <laughs> I just didn't know what to do. And there was no players in there. And I was like, I got to find a story. So I just, I went up to Mike Reichenbach because he was standing in his locker. I don't even know what I asked him. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I just wrote everything he said down and wrote a story. That's just basically a series of Mike Reichenbach books. (laughs) It got better from there, I think, hopefully. Uh, I did it in a weird way. The the first time I'd ever like covered the NFL in any way was during the lockout. Oh, yeah. In 2011. And I just... I was kind of proactive about it and, and guys were like meeting like, cause no, nothing official was allowed to happen. So like players were just like getting together and practicing and a few of the Eagles, like leadership guys started them practicing up uh, fields, my hometown in Marlton, uh, like the, the rec center. So I, I just asked our, our boss at the time, like, Hey, can I go and cover this? And he said, hey, go ahead, get yeah, go nuts. So I was up there and, it was kind of fun because like there was no one to stop you and you just had, but it was also a little daunting to not have anyone to like show you what to do. Uh, and like, I remember like, early on, there was like all these, like Michael Vick was there and shade, like all these guys were shady was there and Deshaun, like all these great players. By the end of it, I was just watching Kafka throw to Jason Avant <laughs> and Clay Harbor. And, uh, but it was like, I, that was the first time I'd ever interviewed NFL players. Interesting. And I like earned my reps to go to training camp like when it finally started that year and then kept growing from there. Good stuff. Good. Uh, man, I was worried we wouldn't have, have enough and we're over an hour. That seems to happen. I think we should do one of these every week. <laughs> Gosh. All right. Are we good here? All good. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hope everyone's having a great summer. We're getting closer. Training camp is not that far away. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, click the like button, subscribe there as well. That's it. For Rube, I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye. We'll talk to you soon.